So it's time now for our next metaphorical fireside chat featuring Jen Prosec, founder and managing partner of Prosec Partners, and Lynn Martin, president of the New York Stock Exchange Group. Please give them a warm welcome as they join us to cover lessons learned from 2022's market volatility and Lynn's outlook for the public markets in 2023. Wow, it's bright. <laughs> it is bright up here, we were warned. Thank you for being here, I'm Jen Prosek. I'm interviewing Lynn Martin, the president of the New York Stock Exchange. Thrilled to be here. Um, Lynn is the 68th president 68. of the New York Stock Exchange? 68, yep. good number. So Lynn, I always say you're the original girl who was coding before girls who coded. Tell us a little bit about your career and how you got started. And one thing you may not know about Lynn is she's more of a technologist, really, than kind yep. of the financial market. Yep. So tell, tell us about your career. Yeah, I like to say that I took a nonlinear path to this role. So my undergraduate degree is in computer science. And like any good uh, comp sci undergrad, my first job was with IBM, writing code um, back in the late 90s, early 2000s, uh, during the dot com. Um, boom, bust, whatever the case may be. And it was really apparent to me that once I was, once I started my career, once I got into my career writing code, that I wasn't a programmer. I wasn't meant to be a programmer. Uh, so I also became very interested in financial markets. Financial services clients were our clients. So um, I got a master's degree in math and wound up at a derivatives exchange um, when they were moving electronic. That's how I got my start in the exchange industry. All right, and you have history with ICE that yep. now owns the New York Stock Exchange. Some people don't understand what ICE is. Yep. Tell everybody what ICE is and how that path led you to the New York Stock Exchange. Yeah, the way we like to describe ourselves at ICE is we are a technology provider. We're a FinTech organization. What we do is take technology and apply it to markets. Uh, we got our start applying a very good technology to the energy markets, focused on adding transparency there. Uh, as we progressed, we acquired the New York Board of Trade. For anyone who watched Trading Places, the Eddie Murphy movie, that's the frozen concentrated orange juice exchange. <laughs> um, and that exchange moved from a floor to the screen uh, using our technology did that same playbook with the New York Stock Exchange, improving the technology there. And more recently, we've been applying the technology to data services and importantly, mortgage technology. So in our view, the strategy is anytime there's an inefficiency in markets, if you have good technology, you can add transparency, add efficiency, and that improves the process. Okay. So and how did ICE go about acquiring the New York Stock Exchange? Why did that happen? That's a great question. <laughs> ICE went public. ICE became a public company in 2005. I think the market cap of the company when it went public was about a billion dollars. Uh, it grew, the public markets rewarded it. And back in 2012, uh, had a very iconic acquisition, which was of the NYSE Group. The NYSE Group had a few different parts to it. It was a European exchange, it was the building on 11 Wall, and it had a variety of technology and data services embedded in it as and, well. And how many, just give us a sense from a technology perspective. Yeah. You talked about the volume of transactions and the technology yeah. needed. Give us a sense of the size and volume. That yeah, happened. so right now we are processing about half a trillion incoming order messages wow. a day. And to give you a sense that those messaging rates are about 20% above the peak levels we saw during the really volatile pandemic during March 2020. So given all the volatility we saw last year, what that has led to is increased numbers of buy, sells, uh, trades, whatever the case may be throughout okay. the course of the year. So it's really important, especially with my technologist hat on, I kind of feel like I have two jobs. Job one is talking to 
our existing community of, list, of listed issuers, those companies who are looking to graduate to the public markets. Um, but then also I gotta look at system capacity because our primary job is to remain open and provide the most deep, liquid, transparent markets in, in the world. Okay, speaking of markets and performance, everyone's gonna wanna know what do you think's happening in 2023 and what is the outlook for IPOs because of course there are many private markets people here yep. who are looking to exit their companies. Yes, so um, I don't have a crystal ball. I wish I did, and I get asked this question a lot. A couple of macro factors you're gonna wanna look at in the markets when it comes down to, can I go public now, can I not go public now? And it's something that we talk to our pipeline of companies who have chosen us waiting to go out. You gotta look at the volatility in the market. The best barometer there, you're gonna wanna look at the VIX. If the VIX is below 20 for a sustained period of time, it means the markets calm down a bit. Now, you have seen periods in 2022 where the VIX did dip below that 20 level, but then immediately came up to 26, 30, whatever the case may be. So then you gotta look at the underlying factors as to what's causing the volatility. Um, obviously, the Fed moves is one of the main factors about what's causing volatility at the moment. And the big question there is really, how far are they gonna go? Are they gonna continue to step on the brakes? And as a result, are they gonna go too far in slowing down our economy? Now, if you look at the most recent data, not whatever's gonna get announced tomorrow, mm -hmm. um, the most recent data, you see that some of their measures have actually worked. And you see inflation, which is the key thing they're trying to solve for, has started to come down from those eight levels that you saw at the end of last year down to you know seven and then most recently the six and a half print. Okay, and make your pitch, you know, there's a few exchanges you could select if you're going yep. public, the New York Stock Exchange being the most iconic. Yep. Um, what, how do you, what's your pitch to a company that's gonna go public? Yeah, there's a few things that we focus on on the NYSE side of the business. Uh, first is the services. You'll get services from both exchanges. Um, it's do these services meet your, meet your needs. The services that we offer tend to be less opinion based. They tend to be focused on just providing you with tools that enable you to effectively run your business. The second area that I encourage companies to look at is the platform you're entering into. And the New York Stock Exchange, as you point out, Jen, is the most iconic platform out there. With that platform comes a different type of currency. And by currency, I mean the types of services we offer to our issuer communities. One in particular being focused on advocacy. And there's a lot going on in this world, geopolitically as well as domestically. So we spend a lot of time in DC, we spend a lot of time globally talking to rule makers, policy makers, whatever the case may be, um, about different ways to continue to cement the US as the center of the global economy. And then last, but probably most important to a company thinking about uh, going public is the community. The community from our perspective is, who are the other 2,400 companies you're joining? Who's the crew you're joining? And the way we like to describe that group is, these aren't just your existing customers, they're your next batch of customers. We have the philosophy where if you join us, if you list on us, we tend to use your services as part of our services package. So that's a great entry point to a lot of our issuer community. And then our issuers are very supportive of each other. We have a variety of different um, networking, uh, roundtable type groups that, that we plumb you into. So I wanna get back to advocacy in a minute, but yeah. back to going public. I mean, going public has sort of, I wouldn't say it's gotten a black eye, but people yeah. say it's too expensive, it's yeah. this, it's that. When should a company go public and are there different ways to go public now you were Yeah, there, there, there are. Um, well, one of our other differentiating factors is really our market model. Our market model involves the floor, so believe it or not, there are still humans. 
What do those humans do? They interact with the half a trillion messages that come out of our matching engine every day. Their job is to devote balance sheets, take the other side, to smooth out imbalances. So that's a, a unique differentiator for us. Companies can go public in this environment. We had companies go public last year. Uh, the largest IPO of the year was a company called Corebridge. It raised $1.7 billion on its IPO day. For those of you who don't know who that company is, they're a spinoff of AIG. It's their life and retirement business. Why were they able to raise 1.7, which was kind of around the target? It was because they had strong balance sheet, strong revenue, strong free, ca strong free cash flow, and good EBITDA margins. Um, so they had really good fundamentals. They, they were a real a business. business. They, were, they were a real business. They weren't growth at all costs. They were a business that was very disciplined and established. So an established business, one that's turning a profit or break even or has a good 12 to 18 month view as to when they are going to be able to turn a profit still has the capacity to go. Certain sectors in particular are very attractive right now. Energy, very attractive. Uh, people who are in clean energy or any sort of industry around the energy evolution from brown to green, there's a market for you there. Even parts of tech, the market I think will welcome, such as cyber or things of that nature. But when you are looking at going public, you can follow the traditional IPO route to your question. You can also do a direct listing. So you gotta ask yourself, what is my primary objective with going public? Do I need to raise capital? If you need to raise capital, you would probably go the traditional IPO route, or we just received approval for direct listing with a capital raise, which does have a bank as an, or a financial institution as an underwriter to stabilize the stock. If you just wanna go public, if you just want to reward existing shareholders, you could go direct listing, which just means your stock opens. You don't have a bank underwriting. You have a financial advisor, and the bank does provide some, some services around that, but it's very different from the traditional IPO process. You're not issuing additional shares in a pure direct listing. You are in the other mechanisms I mentioned. So back to advocacy yep. and ESG. Yeah. One of the things that the New York Stock Exchange does, obviously, is I think a lot in the area of ESG and diversity and board diversity yeah. and all these things. Give a little taste to the audience about all the things you're doing in that area. Yeah, you know, diversity is, um, ESG is a really interesting topic to us. It's this thing that gets used in a really amorphous fashion. Everyone says ESG, they think they're talking about one thing when it's actually three different pillars, environmental, social, and governance. If you talk about diversity, um, those tend to hit social and governance pillars and there, you're looking at either your board composition from a diversity standpoint, or you're looking at your management team uh, from, from a diversity standpoint. You're looking at that as a manager because you believe in diversity, or as a public company, there are increasingly ESG investors, investors who are investing with environmental, social, or governance lenses. And as part of their filtering criteria, they're gonna filter out the less diverse companies and filter in the more diverse companies from their selection criteria. Uh, we've got a bunch of different services around this. Number one, we think it's really important to just give you information about what you're doing and what your peer group is doing. So we have a database called our ESG Viewer, which everyone that's a member of our community has access to, which it's non-opinion based. It's basically scours sustainability reports, filings, websites, whatever the case may be, and distills ESG down to 500 different factors, um, which are publicly reported. Additionally, we have something called the Board Advisory Council, which we started in 2019 to really promote diversity. That is a database of CEO recommended candidates that are board ready. So, database about 520 or so people large now. We have about 30 different CEOs that oversee the council, but any CEO of our community can recommend in candidates to 
our database. And that's really attractive to companies that are looking to go public that want to improve their diversity of their board because here's a variety of candidates that are board ready, yeah. that have audit experience. Amazing nomination yes. experience, um, comp committee experience, whatever committee experience, and you don't have to use a recruiter to go find those people. I was hoping you were gonna mention that database because I think that's very special and very powerful. Back to the IPO market, I think we can all agree it's folks are sitting on the sidelines, yeah. right? Not that you have a crystal ball, but do you think that you know there's gonna be a little burst of energy sometime in 2023? I think there could be second half. Um, I, people initially had said Q, three or people had said second half and the optimists in the room will hear, okay, that's July. She said July or he said mm -hmm. July. It feels to me like September, October more or more towards the, you know, yep. that, that time, probably a Q4 time. Uh, but, you know, there are companies that are trying to get out as yeah. soon as possible. We have companies that tell us they want to get out in April. Some tell us they want to get out in June. Yeah. So um, companies are really just waiting. And I think this Fed meeting and March's Fed meeting are going to be two key litmus tests. If they slow down the rate of interest rate increase tomorrow and they take a pause in March, I think you'll start to see some green shoots appear about people. Okay, unfair question market. because you love all your children the same, but <laughs> any fam favorite uh, IPO at the exchange since you've been there or a day that was particularly well, I've electric? Only, I've only been in my seat for a year. That's true. So there weren't a lot of IPOs <laughs> last year. So everyone was my favorite children and I can <laughs> name my children off the top of my head last year. Um, meaningful days for us last year, which just showed our convening power. I'd say the first one was President Zelensky back to our platform. He approached us to do a round table with our CEOs. We did it the day after Labor Day. He rang our bell, he gave That's an cool. address from our podium. Um, that was pretty special. And there were five of his deputy ministers with us from the Ukraine that came to the US um, on the podium too. Uh, and this was preceded by a round table with about 20 of our CEOs of our listed community. So that day was uh, pretty special. On the fun side, I mean, Serena Williams came and rang Super our bell, fun. which that was really fun as You know, well. she's in private equity now. She is. I, that's, <laughs> that's what she was celebrating. Yes. She was celebrating Serena Ventures. Oh, okay, cool. And her next chapter. And I know that there are other next chapters that you're going to well, hear Kim from Kardashian later today. Well, be here so. later, yes. I'm sure Serena will take the stage at some point. So yeah, I mean, it was really the, the ones, the moments that really resonated with me the most were the fun moments, but then also, you know, the 20 different world leaders that came through our building yeah, last year. Super cool. Secretary Yellen, um, Prime Minister of Japan gave a policy address from our boardroom. Like there, there's just amazing stuff that happens at NYSE. Yeah, and I mean, being such an iconic institution, there's also like probably a lot of pressure <laughs> that you represent that iconic institution. What's the biggest challenge of your role? Um, the biggest challenge of my role is trying to be everywhere all at once. Yeah. Like there's just, there's a lot of ground to cover in this role. Um, talking to companies that, because I feel that we in particular have a duty to just educate companies irrespective of where they are looking to list about what public markets are like. What does it mean to be a public company? Where are the disclosures required? What does your first year in the seat look like? You know, I, I just feel that it's our obligation irrespective of where you're listing. So we spend a lot of time with uh, private companies. On the public company side, I have 2,400 CEOs that Amazing. I'm trying to, uh, <laughs> to get to. And I, ma I made a good crack at it last year. Um, but these are really uncertain and really volatile times. So everyone's got their own set of issues that you know, they want to talk about, be it wage inflation, be it back to office, be it um, just inflation, supply chain disruption. That was another big one we spent a lot of time with our CEOs on. There are a lot of issues that CEOs are, are grappling with, in addition to why is my stock down from 2021. Yes. 
So as a woman who comes out of technology, who really, in some ways, you're before your time, are you happy with um, the progress with women in tech, women in finance? I'm happy with the progress of women in tech in the younger generation because I'm a, I'm a mom of two kids. I see that there are programs that are tailored towards girls and making girls interested in coding, making girls interested in robotics. Stuff like that didn't exist yes. when I was a kid. I wasn't. You must have been lonely for you. It was, <laughs> it was, I, I figured it out. It was it was fine. But I mean, there wasn't like there wasn't a robotics class focused on making a doll, automating a doll, or there wasn't a graphic design class focused on dressing yes. a doll, yes. or <laughs> coding about I don't know an ice cream store, or you, you know things that would appeal to young women. So I think there is still a ways to go with getting women into technology and women into finance, but I think it starts at the really young years in piquing their interest in these topics I as opposed to agree more. more I have traditional a 15 year old ones. daughter and she came home one day, she's like, mommy, I'm in a jewelry making class. I'm like, you are? It wasn't jewelry making, it was 3D printing. Exactly. Robotics, I'm like, she thinks exactly. she's making jewelry, but exactly. she is really doing tech and science. Exactly, it's Super subliminal. Cool. It's subliminal, right. So not intimidating right. and drawing women. Right. Do you think it's um, more, do you think there's been more progress in tech or finance for women? Because you're kind of sitting in the middle. I finance. finance. Good news, everybody, finance is I'd ahead of I'd say finance, tech. because there are portions of finance marketing, sales, which are just natural places for women to, to land. And as a busy CEO who has to get around to all of those clients, yeah, basically, clients. and represent uh, the New York Stock Exchange, how do you stay current and how do you learn about markets? Is there anything you read or see? Yeah. What's your routine? Um, I ask a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. um, you can get flooded by research, you can get flooded by, you know, thought pieces. I like to talk to people to understand what's going on. The job I did before the last year and change of my life was running our fixed income platforms and our fixed income um, data business uh, for our parent company. And the job I had before that, I was CEO of a futures exchange. So I still have a network of traders I could call. Um, when I want to scratch the itch of, well, the US muni market seems to be having some stress. I, don't understand. So you what's go direct going on to the here. source, direct yeah. to the floor. Yeah, or just yeah, exactly. Like, what are you seeing in the market? Because the one thing that I appreciate, or I've grown to appreciate, is the market's all interconnected. I know there was a credit panel on here before, but I mean, stocks, credit. Yeah. I mean, it's all, it's all connected. People don't just look at stocks as a single asset class. They don't just look at um, uh, fixed income as a single asset class. I mean, that's like one of the biggest misnomers in the world, considering the complexity of those markets. So um, I think it's important to understand the interplay between the markets and yeah. what's driving uh, the different market effects. And to that end, because we are mostly at an alts conference, many, many private markets yeah. companies, it seems like when you read about public and private markets, it's like public versus private markets. But to your point, it's one ecosystem. What do you say to people about the interplay? What is important? I think private markets are incredibly important because there's periods of time when you all have amazing ideas and you should just be focused on building on those ideas. And because you have developed these amazing technologies, amazing ideas, amazing products, it's why the world is going to be better tomorrow than it is today. I look at things like agritech and people talk about food insecurity. And that gives me hope that like, you know, we'll figure out you know, food shortages and food deserts and all, all those sorts of things. And you, know, you look at clean energy, and it's like, okay, well, there's people that are actually worrying about the damage we're potentially doing to our planet. There's just so much innovation that is fostered by the private markets that I think without that, I think it becomes a challenge. And the last thing I'll ask you is um, obviously a lot of talk about crypto with the FTX yeah. explosion and all the rest of it. 
how do you feel about crypto? Is there a place for crypto companies on the New York Stock Exchange? Or are you more psyched about the underlying technology than you are the currency? I'm pretty business? psyched about the underlying technology because I think the blockchain technology can have a variety of use cases around supply chain, um, things of that nature. And I think the underlying digitization of currencies, be it Bitcoin, Ether, but more importantly, fiat will help uh, fund emerging markets and get funding to emerging markets for much more of a, of a social good. So I think the underlying technology is really, really sound. On FTX, I mean, I've, I've said publicly, I, the, the problem with FTX was just the market structure. Like it, it, it didn't have regulation around it. The collateral it was accepting was printed by it. So there's just so many governance issues. There's so many market structure issues with that alone. Um, it'll be interesting to me to see digital currencies, um, non-fiat currencies, what comes out of them. I think there's still very much a place for them, but I think you need to have the guardrails around it. You need the regulation around it, so that way people don't get burned if something goes wrong. I mean, there's so many times that the more traditional, and people say boring, market structures have uh, prevented defaults, have mitigated bankruptcies, have guaranteed settlement during times of bankruptcy. So um, they work. Can they be improved? Absolutely. Markets can always be improved and made more efficient, definitely through the use of technology. But you got to actually respect some of the traditional market structures, too, because they have worked through significant stress periods in our, in our economy. Okay, last question. I always like to end with something called check this out, <laughs> which is something you would like the audience to check out about the New York Stock Exchange and something just like you're fascinated with in life that you say check this out. It could be a Netflix show, it could be a podcast. So first, what should we check out at the New York Stock Exchange? Ooh. You should come visit the New York Stock Exchange. There you go. Check, May, out, uh, check out the, the New York Stock Exchange. Um, How do you check out the New York Stock Exchange? Can you come see it? Can you you, you, you reach out to any of our reps. I mean, we're all over LinkedIn. We're all over um, various other social media, Instagram, Twitter, whatever. Okay, Name your so favorite social platform. Check out the iconic. Um, the amount of, you're in there, you feel a history of the place and there are amazing mar artifacts that you would see but I think what most people don't appreciate is how digital how tech forward it is until you're actually and how you there. get a shiver up your spine when you go in <laughs> the physical building um, it's an American institution okay and what should we check out just in Lynn's Oof. world that you're fascinated with I mean, I binge watch a lot of Netflix shows. All right, what's your fave? Um, what do you love? So I recently binge watched, because we're a sponsor of this company, Drive to Survive. So I, I got very fascinated by season four. Um, we sponsor McLaren. We sponsor their Extreme E series, which is a series that uses um, sustainable cars. Um, there's evidently a lot of drama coming out in season five with the shift of drivers. So if you've uh, if you've watched any of these series before, they transferred out their main driver from season four, and there's some court case that comes on season five. So I'm excited to check that out. Awesome. And on I, February 24th. I mean, he was. I just interviewed. I just did a fireside chat with him in Davos, and I don't think he was supposed to talk about the court case. And he started talking about this court case, and like everyone was just mesmerized, like. Oh, wow. <laughs> awesome. You should be an investigative journalist. Um, and uh, what was I going to say? So Kim Kardashian apparently will be filming live here for her, I think, Hulu show. So Hulu show, good yes. Good that we ended on a series. We're out of time, so thank you, Lynn Martin. Thank you, Jen. thank you all for coming. Thank you. All right. <laughs>